Hey buddies, so nuts guy here. Hope you're having an awesome day so far. In this video, we're quickly gonna go through kind of 10, kind of intermediate level tips and tricks. Some of these might be towards the more beginner side. Some of these might be quite a bit more advanced. Um, it's a bit of a mishmash, so they're not necessarily gonna relate to each other. It's kind of more than 10 tips. I kind of merged a few tips together to create sort of a good single tip. So it's kind of more than 10 as well. Uh, but guys, I hope you enjoy the video. Alrighty, first one is going to be about policies. Now you can check your active policies by going to the council up there on the top right. And then you can check active policies here. This can help you to remind you of what policies you have currently running and therefore how you would want to react and how you want to build according to that. The second part of this sort of tip 1B is to familiarize yourself with all the potential policies that are out there. There are only you know, a finite amount of policies. I'm sure they'll be written up on the wiki at some point. But if, if, you, if you familiarize yourself with what's uh, available and what might be good to build around, um, then you can kind of preempt that in your early stages of your game. So what I mean as an example is I've seen this mandatory harvesting quite frequently. You gain two wheat every uh, for every wheat farm inside of a peasant district. So I don't build my wheat farms off in random places. Every time I start a new game, I always build my wheat farms in peasant districts because I am certain, or I'm not certain, but I'm confident that that policy will come up eventually and that will be helpful. Another one being, as an example, to increase the production uh, by one of any building inside the citizen district. So I will often uh, put my things like my brewery so I can produce extra ale. Uh, I'll often put that in the citizen dr district, hoping to get that active policy, if that makes sense. Alrighty. The next tip is that you can actually have more than 12 overall dice. Your pool only allows 12 at any given time, and if you have more than 12 dice, you can have up here 13 out of 12 as an example. And as long as you have dice constantly out of the pool, you can actually maintain more than 12 dice at a time. Now, if one of these finishes the job and returns to the pool while the pool is full, you don't get a chance to do something about it. Uh, you don't get a chance to move one out of the pool into a job. It will say, hey, you've got too many dice. Which one do you want to delete? Um, but you can maintain or more than 12 as long as you're on top of making sure that they're constantly out doing jobs. And this can kind of segue into a potential early game strategy where instead of trying to maintain their durability early game with a cookhouse at low value, you know, food to only four durability, you can cycle your peasants, get to, you know, 12, 15, 16 peasants early game, have them smashing out jobs really, really quickly for you, let their durability run down towards, you know, the, the early mid game. Um, you know, you'll filter down to 12 because they'll die of durability. And the point there being then you can go to the point where you can upgrade the rations upgrade uh, for your cookhouse so that you're getting maximum value out of your early game food, if that makes sense. All right, so part of this tip may seem obvious and then part of it not so much. So I'm gonna start from the beginning here. So obviously the face level of your die, so this one's three, this one's eight as an example. The face level of your die obviously is quite important, but they relate to different jobs in different ways. So certain jobs, such as farming wheat, as an example, require a certain amount of work to be required, but then it just gives you the same amount every time. So this requires two work that can either be two singles or one uh, die with a two or higher face, and it will just give you one wheat or more if you have the knowledge for more or, or the policies for more. Things like your uh, resource gathering from the forest or the mines or the stone, these will give you the amount of resources dependent on the, the die face. So if you have an eight, uh, an eight for gathering here, you'll gain eight resources from that without modifiers. There are certain areas where, like the herbalist hut, where the result is random, but it's influenced by the die face. So, you know, <laughs> it's not going to be a set number like eight gathering to eight resources, but the higher the die face, the better. All right, so part of this tip may seem obvious and then part of it not so much. So I'm going to start from the beginning here. So obviously the face level of your die, so this one's three, this one's eight as an example. The face level of your die obviously is quite important, but they relate to different jobs in different ways. So certain jobs, such as farming wheat as an example, require a certain amount of work to be required but then it just gives you the same amount every time. So this requires two work that can either be two singles or one uh, die with a two or higher face, and it will just give you one wheat or more if you have the knowledge for more or, or the policies for more. Things like your uh, resource gathering from the forest or the mines or the stone, 
These will give you the amount of resources dependent on the, the die face. So if you have an eight, uh, an eight for gathering here, you'll gain eight resources from that without modifiers. There are certain areas where, like the herbalist hut, where the result is random, but it's influenced by the die face. So, you know, <laughs> it's not going to be a set number like eight gathering to eight resources, but the higher the die face, the better. The way the herbalist hut and the ruins work are fairly different from some of the other encounters, so I'm going to quickly explain those for you. The herbalist hut will search nearby forests and has a chance to give you one herb per nearby forest. Now that the the amount will or the percentage chance of getting a, a herb from each individual forest will be influenced by the die face. So if you have an eight die face searching there, you're going to be a higher chance of getting at least one or one herb from each nearby forest. Now that doesn't matter uh, about how many resources that forest has left. So this is a kind of a tip within a tip here. You see the red number on the top right corner, that 32, that says that there are 32 pieces of wood that you can gain from that forest. I can bring this all the way down to one with my uh, gatherers and then the, the herbalist hut will still work. So what I'd wanna do here is farm these down to, to one remaining each and then leave them so that they're, or one or two or three or four or whatever, and then leave them there for the herbalist hut to work. Because if, uh, if I completely deplete these, then the herbalist hut will not work anymore. Now the ruins is slightly different. I didn't leave a ruins on the map, which silly me, I should have, so I could show you that. But it's quite easy to explain anyway. So the way that the ruins work is you go in and you have a chance to find some random resources. You go in with, uh, you know, with the, one of the, the exploring die face. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, and the higher the die face, the higher chance that you'll successfully gain some resources. Now, if you fail, you flee, and sometimes your dice can get wounded. Not a big deal. Now, if you're successful, you'll get a certain amount of random resources and the option to leave or continue deeper in. If you continue deeper in, it'll get harder and harder, a higher chance of failing. But if you're successful, you'll get more and more resources. Now, if you, if you fail you will lose all the resources you've gained so far. So when going into a rune, you want to go with the highest die face possible. And it's basically like, you know, it's it's potluck. Do you, do you delve deeper and risk all the things that you've gained so far to get more stuff? Or do you play it safe and leave with what the loot that you've already got? Quick tip on some positive random uh, actions, events that can happen throughout the game. So you see how you got the flashing red icon for your enemies. You can also get a flashing blue icon for a helpful limited time event. I've been waiting for one to show you guys, but I haven't been having one triggered, so I'm just going to again explain it for you very quickly. There's a flashing blue potential event. It doesn't give you much of a notification, so you want to keep your eye out. Those flashing blue events can be something helpful and positive. Now, what you do with those is when you see them, you just hover over them and it will tell you what it does. So it'll tell you whether it requires resources or certain types of die face to activate it. And it will tell you what it does when it's activated. There's certain mercenaries, I believe, that can increase the, val the power of your die face. Uh, there's like sort of monks that can come in and heal your dice or uh, recover some durability. There's some that come in and say, hey, we want, we want work and gathering die face to be given to us for a sec and then we'll offer you free herbs. There's a whole bunch of different cool things that you can do with those, so keep an eye out for those. It can be quite helpful. Perfect. Just a few minutes after I recorded that clip, um, we have this guy who's popped up. Now, this guy's an ominous mercenary, and it looks like he's going to train our raid stat, and it'll cost us two ale. So if I take this guy here, this guy, this die, and I give this guy two beer, two ale, he is wounded, but it's increased his die face. So it actually said in the sort of flavor text there, his his uh, his methods might be brutal. So he's trained up my die face there, cost two ale, um, but it also got wounded in the process. So that's kind of how those work. Someone asked me in my comments how the blessed mechanic works. So I just wanted to show you guys that real quickly as well. So we've got the shrine here. The shrine takes two prey and will bless uh, one of your dice. So what we can do is we can take the dice that we want to bless, put that in there, and then we put the monk with enough blessing, uh, enough enough prey in there. Eat, pray, love. <laughs> Eat, pray, bless. Um, and then this is going to bless the dice. Now what the blessed um, does is it, it, it makes it immune to the next status effect. So what you might want to do as an example is uh, bless pre-winter, or you can bless your combat dice, the dice that you usually use for fighting, and that will stop them from getting frozen, the winter thing, and it'll stop them from getting wounded, obviously, for fighting. In Dice Legacy, there are a number of additional types of settlements that you will find that you can interact with in different ways. Um, it, it, in terms of trading, 
you can uh, you can set up a trading post uh, and within range of them, and they, you will then be able to trade with them with a merchant die with the trade face. And you can trade with them. The first time you trade with them, you'll gain some a little bit of free resources, nothing nothing major. Then you'll open up this slot here, which will allow you to trade um, for specific resources. So this wants to trade two gold, and it will deliver you some food. Now, once you've gotten your relationship level to max by basically giving them free stuff, um, you can open up a second uh, location as well here, or technically a third location. Now, this location, up until the point where I became a uh, full friendly bar with them, was unavailable. Then the second slot opened up. Now, I've seen this before as a healing place where they just asked for a herb and they restored your durability back to max, I think. Um, and then uh, there's other trade ones where you can just trade gold for various resources. The trade gold for resources, it cycles. So this is two gold for food. Next time I do, after I've done this, it'll refresh as two gold for a different type of resource. It, it cycles through the different resources. All right. All right. Lastly, I want to talk about the forge enhancing the forge in the laboratory. Now, I'm probably going to do a separate video for these specifically. I'll link it in the top right corner for you. If I do, I want to go into a bit more depth. There's actually quite a bit of little intricacies and in how they work, different traits that you can gain from forging, etc. Um, and this video is not going to go into that in detail. We're just going to go through a quick overview on how the different things work here. So the enhancement chamber takes resources normally starts off by also requiring herbs but there's a uh, manipulation trait that you can get to to make it so it doesn't cost herbs and i would actually highly recommend unlocking most of the enhancement uh traits or, or knowledge prior to um uh, prior to doing much enhancing or forging as an example you see an unlock enhancement chamber it, then it provides one extra power to face, and then it provides an extra power to a random face. So the point being is the resources that you're spending versus the reward that you're getting is obviously better if you've unlocked these additional technologies. Same thing with the forge. So the forge, um, these two upgrades allow you to produce more powerful construct die, and this is even more powerful construct die. So it doesn't really seem make, like it makes much sense to unlock the forge and use it before you've gotten these enhancements to it if that makes sense so just a bit of a mentality with regards to the knowledge and and using them basically how they work is the enhancement chamber you give it the resources at once and then it will accept the dice and it will empower the dice that you place on it so if i wanted to empower this building face i just slap it on there and that will then improve the power of that now the forge and the laboratory work a little bit differently the forge will allow you to create construct die which have a maximum die face of eight as opposed to the default four for regular die and essentially what you do is you combine two dice in here. So you just take whatever two dice you want and you throw them in here and it will generate a single construct dice with um, a random combination of the six die face across the two dice that you put in there. So it randomly selects the six, six, the, the six die face from the two dice that you put in there, slaps them together and creates a construct die. Construct die are incredibly powerful and through the forge, they can also gain additional perks or traits um, that will give you certain bonuses. Like some mean that it can't be affected by any type of status effect that includes freezing or wounding, but it also includes blessing. But I guess you don't need to bless it if it's immune to everything anyway. Um, there's other ones which will be, uh, you know, increase the max durability. There's one really good one, which means that it doesn't take any durability to re-roll. There's also some negative ones, so you can get bad ones. So you want to experiment with the forge, you want to mash things together and see if you can come out with some positive combinations. Um, and then you really want to strengthen up those dice uh, with the enhancement chamber to get them to full eight face die like these ones. These ones are full eight face die. Now these ones don't have any traits because I actually created these with the laboratory. So the laboratory is, le it's not RNG based. You essentially choose the six die face that you want. However, it does not give you um, traits or perks like the forge does. So you can li literally choose six different dice. The way this works is you pick up your dice or your die. You pick it up. I'm not going to do it now because I just pause. You pick up your die and you put it there. That will destroy that die and then load up that face. You see we have the extracted faces there in the middle of the, the little pop-up. That will then add those left to right uh, onto your extracted faces. Once you have six extracted faces, the laboratory will create that construct die for you. Gains no perks or traits. The forge gives you perks or traits, but is randomly generated the six die face from two different dice. So you can create some really, really powerful dice, but it's RNG based with the forge. You can create some very good dice with the laboratory, but it does not give you the maximum potential, if that makes sense. 
Alrighty guys, that's about that. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos, like my extensive detailed forge and laboratory guide, we're just going to talk about the different traits, how to get the different traits, like how to increase the chances of getting specific traits that you might want to go for, and what the best combination of dice for in terms of forging of the laboratory might be as well. We're going to go into that into a deep dive in that video whenever I make that, which will probably be sometime this week, posting either next Friday or maybe the following Monday. We shall see. If you guys like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more, consider subscribing. I already said that. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Have a good one.